I always knew that I wanted to do something around uh, news and information. I remember buying multiple newspapers when I was a kid, thinking it was interesting how the same story could be covered so differently and um, really liked that idea. And back then, you could buy a newspaper for a dime or a quarter, so it wasn't the same investment. Um, I started in radio and um, I thought I was going to be a play-by-play -play announcer. And uh, I was doing radio tournaments at Fort Hall and Pocatello and actually one in Washington State. And um, out of the blue, I got a job at the same radio station doing the Showband Radio Hour, which was one of those Sunday public affairs shows. And as part of that, I started, I'd play music and talk about things going on, events coming up. And pretty soon I started doing news and I think the bug was hit and um, I wanted to do more news. When I started, we were still using typewriters. We were still using typesetting. We were still using um, devices that have all been replaced by a computer and even more important, uh, by a cell phone. You can do more on a cell phone now, both in terms of a TV studio and in terms of print than you could do in entire operations in newsrooms a generation ago. We used to have one camera for shooting pages that took up a whole room and um, you don't need any of that anymore. It's all evolved. I've just had so many amazing adventures. Um, the most amazing one was uh, I was speaking in a little town in Southern Ontario, Kettle Point and Stony uh, Point Reserve. And that night um, that I was speaking, one of the other speakers was Elijah Harper. And the night before that, he had um, been a member of the Manitoba Senate and voted against Canada's constitution and brought the whole process down. And uh, when he walked in the arena that I'll just never forget, it was like a conquering hero. The place just erupted with excitement. And I was able to write about it for the Arizona Republic where I worked at the time. Most of the hardships I've had in my career are more about trying to make sure that organizations have a future. Um, it was really sad when we lost the Navajo Times and um, we knew there were some issues with the election and that I thought I was going to be fired, but I was surprised because they shut down the whole newspaper and that's something I didn't expect. When they brought it back after that, they brought it back as kind of a newsletter and it eventually grew back to the Navajo Times, but it took um, several years before that happened. That was a hardship, no doubt. Uh, the practical side of that job, the hardship was just distributing. Uh, we were a daily newspaper and we were under instructions from the tribal uh, subcommittee on the council to serve the entire reservation. And uh, that meant distributing every day to some pretty remote places. We did it with an airplane, which was hugely challenging and expensive, but it, it worked for a long time. I've had so much fun. I can't think of how many times where I've been out on a story and I think I'm just so lucky to be here. Mr. President, you've been a governor and a president, so you have a unique experience looking at it from two directions. What do you think tribal sovereignty means in the, tri in the 21st century? And how do we resolve conflicts between tribes and the federal and state governments? Yeah. Uh, tribal sovereignty means that, it's sovereign. I mean, it's, you, you're a, you're a, you've been given sovereignty and you're viewed as a sovereign entity. And therefore, the relationship between the federal government and tribes is one between sovereign entities. I covered the space shuttle landing after Challenger, and I was at the Arizona Republic, and of course, you try to localize the story. So I remember walking around the parking lot looking for Arizona license plates for people to interview. And I just kept thinking how incredibly lucky I was to be there. There's been so many fun stories. Um, certainly, the sheer ability to visit Indian country. And I've been lucky enough to probably, of the 500 plus reservations, I've probably visited in some sense 300. Ability to talk to people in different communities. And um, one of the things I just love is that it takes about 10 minutes when you visit a tribal community to see how much talent there is out there and to really uh, appreciate how strong uh, young people are and look forward to learning from them. The story that impacted me the most though, writing about my own son and his death, and um, it's one I think about almost every day. You can see the tornado behind me. It is growing in large. You need to stay indoors, people. Stay indoors. 
uh, it's hard to um, separate something that personal from what you do for a living. And um, the silence was a really tough one. This started with Shirley's Navy, who um, was looking at a film for Frontline. And as she was looking through the script, she basically let them know that they had to have some Native involvement. It just couldn't be people um, from the outside reporting this community. So she suggested me and uh, David Panning, who was the executive producer of Frontline, called and asked if I would uh, report the story. It involved sexual abuse uh, by priests in a remote Alaska village. And um, my first inclination was, I don't want to do this story. It's not one that I really want to be associated with. And um, after a while, I thought, you know, you don't get calls very often from national media like Frontline. I really should do this story. And so I agreed. And it's one of those ones where at the time I didn't want to do it, but I'm so glad I did. The people I met were so extraordinary and the challenges they faced in their lives were, were so much greater than anything I had. And um, I'm really proud of the story, the silence that ran on the front line. And I think my being a part of it made it a much better story. I would tell younger journalists that um, find your passion, find out what really motivates you, become an expert in whatever you can, and uh, use that as the compass to guide you, those two things. Um, I like to joke that journalism for me is not like working for a living. And when you're out on a story, there's nothing better. You're just appreciating where you're at, the people you're talking to and learning from. And you get paid to learn every day. What could be better than that? I think of all the people who have jobs where they go to every day and they aren't inspired. And that's just never been the case for me. I love talking to people and learning from them and interviewing them and uh, building on that.